This episode, and others like it, are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. Get some cool perks and help support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. I also recently launched a new channel dedicated to the nuts and bolts of making a living as a creative. If that sounds like something you'd enjoy, you can check it out at the link below. There are five times in Earth's history where we had mass extinctions. By mass extinctions, I mean at least 75%, three quarters of the known species disappearing from the face of the Earth. Now we're witnessing what a lot of people are calling the sixth mass extinction, where the same thing could happen on our watch. The data are rock solid. I don't think you'll find a scientist that will say we're not in an extinction crisis. So, in this episode, we're going to talk about the sixth mass extinction, what's driving it, and what, if anything, can be done about it. The first thing we need to do when talking about mass extinction is to establish what exactly that means. It's a scary term. For most people, it conjures up images of the dinosaurs getting wiped out by an asteroid and the Earth being plunged into fire and darkness. Well, I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is that mass extinction doesn't always mean apocalyptic, literally earth-shattering calamities. The scientific benchmark for mass extinction is 75% or more of existing species completely dying out in a relatively short period of time, geologically speaking, usually less than about 2.8 million years. Extinction is a normal part of life on Earth, so much so that we've defined what's called a background rate of extinction, which comes out to between 0.1 and 1 species per 10,000 per 100 years. Okay, that doesn't sound so bad. 2.8 million years is a long time, even if we're experiencing a mass extinction event. Well, here's the bad news. The event unfolding now is happening on a scale unprecedented since the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. And it's happening incredibly quickly and continuing to accelerate. In 1991, one salmon species was endangered. Today, it's 14. Countless insect species are already gone for good. A WWF study says that in the past 50 years, the abundance of global wildlife has collapsed by 69%, with the worst effects being seen in Latin America, where abundance has fallen by 94% since 1970. According to a number of studies, the current rate of extinction is between 100 and 1,000 times higher than the pre-human background rate. And that should give you a clue as to what's driving this crisis. To anyone paying attention, it's pretty clear why we're experiencing a sixth mass extinction. It's easy to say that humans are a blight, or we've overpopulated the Earth, or some other vague condemnation of our species as a whole. But that's not the problem. There's plenty of room for all of us. There's plenty of food for all of us. The Earth isn't overburdened. And anyone who claims otherwise is either misguided or trying to sell you on some Malthusian worldview. The problem is that since the Industrial Revolution, the world's dominant economic system has been built on the core principles of extraction, accumulation, profit maximization, and endless growth. It stands to reason that if the profit motive is the sole determinant of the path society takes, any number of crimes against our environment can be waved off as necessary sacrifices. Take logging, for example. When managed sustainably, trees are a renewable resource. They just take time to grow. A common sense system would ensure that we don't chop down more trees than we can replace over a given period. But that, of course, doesn't take into account the fact that we could generate more money and produce more stuff if we do keep chopping the trees. The Amazon rainforest is one of the planet's most crucial carbon sinks. A carbon sink is something that absorbs more carbon from the atmosphere than it produces. These are incredibly valuable resources, and critical to sustaining most life on Earth. In recent decades, thanks to deforestation and human-caused climate change, the Amazon is nearing what's called a dieback loop. Since the rainforest creates and relies on its own rainfall, when trees are killed by logging or wildfire, it becomes harder to maintain that fragile equilibrium. At some point, the Amazon will begin to fail. And as it fails, more trees will die. And as they die, the process will accelerate. And eventually, what was once the most vibrant expanse of plant life on Earth will be dry, desolate savanna. That's a dieback loop. 
and we're actively shooting ourselves in the foot by carving up the lungs of the planet for the sake of greater capital accumulation. Now, the Amazon dying off is a big picture problem, but if we zoom in a little bit, we can see where the current extinctions come into play. Habitat destruction is a major cause of the eradication of animal life on Earth. Humans have taken over 70% of the planet's land, as well as 75% of its freshwater resources. If we were just making use of those resources and living sustainably within these ecosystems, it would be fine. But the problem is, we bulldoze them, or strip them bare, or poison the water supply with industrial waste, or put up walls that block key migration paths, or kill any animals larger than a house cat because they're seen as a danger to humans. But you might be thinking, so what? They're just animals, right? Yeah, it's sad that some cool animals are going extinct, but at the end of the day, they're just not that important. Let me introduce you to what's called a keystone species. This is a gray wolf. Back in the 1930s, these majestic creatures were killed off in Yellowstone National Park. For the next 70 years, the deer and elk populations in the park exploded, straining the area's carrying capacity. What's more, without the wolves as a threat, the elk didn't feel the need to move around as much, and decimated the local plant population with their incessant grazing. This in turn damaged the beaver population, which relied on willow to survive through the winter. This continued on down the food chain. With the removal of one species, the entire ecosystem began to collapse. In 1995, gray wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone, and what's happened since then has been nothing short of incredible. With the wolves back, elk had to be more mobile, moving around to avoid the predators. This allowed the local flora to recover, with once bare hillsides now covered with trees and shrubs. With the trees came the birds, songbirds and ravens and eagles. The willows recovered, which provided food for the beavers. The wolves also acted as food distributors, leaving carrion for countless species, such as ravens, crows, eagles, magpies, coyotes, foxes, and bears. They killed coyotes, which allowed rabbits, mice, badgers, and other smaller animals to recover. The mice and rabbits brought ever more birds of prey. Before the wolves came back, there was just one group of beavers left in the park. Today, there are nine beaver colonies. But it didn't stop there, not even close. The beavers spread and built dams, which had multiple effects. They tamed the seasonal runoff, created pools that stored water to recharge the water table, and provided shaded areas for fish and aquatic ecosystems for otters and muskrats. But most incredibly of all, the behavior of the rivers themselves responded to the wolves. With the ecosystem stabilized and the trees growing back, there was less erosion of the banks. The rivers flowed straighter and narrower, more pools formed, and all of this in turn reinforced the strength of the new wildlife by providing habitats for the many diverse species of the park. All of this, down to the very geography of the park, was revitalized by the presence of one single species. That's why gray wolves and certain other animals are considered keystone species, because without them, entire ecosystems fall apart. Now think about what it means that we're on track to eradicate over 75% of animal species on Earth. How many of those will be keystone species? How many that we don't even know are keystone species yet? But maybe that's still not enough. Maybe you still feel like it doesn't really matter, that we're insulated from the collapse. It may be hard to hear, but we are very much a part of this biosphere. We don't get to exist outside and above the rest of life on Earth. We are entirely dependent on it for our survival. Let's consider another factor in the mass extinction. Climate change. Beginning with the Industrial Revolution, humans have pumped ever more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, drastically accelerating the warming of the planet. Back in the 70s, Exxon, yes, that Exxon, the fossil fuel giant, conducted the world's first truly comprehensive study into the effects of climate change. Their results were shocking and surprisingly accurate. They determined that their activity, and that of the rest of the oil and gas industry, would directly contribute to unsafe levels of warming, which would have untold negative effects on life. In a just world, they would have revealed their findings. But as a capitalist firm, under a capitalist system, they followed the prime directive, the profit motive. And instead of revealing their findings, they buried them and launched the most comprehensive corporate propaganda campaign in modern history. The rest you've heard before. 
If we don't cap warming at 1.5 degrees, we're in for a bad time. It'll accelerate the dieback loop of the Amazon. The oceans will become increasingly uninhabitable. We'll face more frequent and devastating weather events, including droughts, hurricanes, wildfires, and monsoons. And entire regions of the planet will become too hot to safely sustain human populations. But what I really want to stress about this is how it will affect our food supply. Remember how I said we rely on the rest of the animals on the planet? Let's start with fish. Like the Amazon, the world's oceans are a crucial carbon sink. Since we began tracking it in the 1970s, oceans have absorbed 93% of the world's excess heat generated by greenhouse gas emissions. This has contributed to a rapidly warming aquatic environment. They've also become starkly more acidic and contain less oxygen. The ocean is home to somewhere between 500,000 and 10 million distinct species, a massive chunk of the planet's biodiversity, on a scale that would make Yellowstone blush. As of right now, the oceans are expected to warm by up to 4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. That's a whole lot more than the 1.5 degrees where we'd already be having a bad time. So what does that look like? By 2050, the tropics will see a decrease of 40% in their seafood catch. Shrimp could lose 70% of their habitat to warming waters in the Gulf of Mexico. From 2014 to 2016, Pacific cod populations decreased by 70% in the Gulf of Alaska. Entire fishing communities are no longer able to sustain themselves by catching salmon. Fisheries have closed. Coastal towns have enacted strict fishing restrictions where once there was no need. And low-income countries that are heavily dependent on seafood are being disproportionately affected by the climate fallout that is mostly the fault of industrialized nations. And it's not just fish. Food crops are at risk as well. Everything from staples like maize and corn to luxuries like cocoa and coffee are also in the crosshairs. The Yellowstone example should demonstrate just how interconnected the planet's ecosystems are. Plants, animals, even the terrain itself relies on a fragile equilibrium to thrive. But don't take any of this from me. The world scientists are in agreement. To quote a 2022 IPCC report, climate change will increasingly put pressure on food production and access especially in vulnerable regions, undermining food security and nutrition. The capitalist tendencies of overproduction, waste, and hyperconsumerism are only making these problems worse. Consumption drives extraction. Extraction drives exploitation. Exploitation maintains poverty and suffering. The myth that capitalism will one day magically provide this wasteful, first-world quality of life for everyone is just that. A myth. And even if it did, the Earth couldn't sustain it. Studies on global consumption suggest that in order to maintain a hyper-consuming Western lifestyle for every person on the planet, we'd need the resources of five Earths. This is why people say we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the planet itself will be fine. That's not going anywhere. It's our own survival and the existence of countless amazing and often critical species that we're putting at risk. The five past mass extinctions all happened well before humans came onto the scene. They were natural. A massive asteroid, for example, or increased volcanic activity. The extinction we face today is of our own making. We have the data. We know what's causing this. And we know what economic system relies on causing these problems of extraction, overconsumption, and endless growth. If we want to stop the dying, the destruction of life as it has existed for the last 60 million years, we must dismantle capitalism. Even the scientists who are so afraid to say that capitalism is the problem recognize that this system cannot and will not solve the problems it creates. I know there's no political will to do any of the things that I'm concerned with, which is exactly why I and the vast majority of my colleagues think we're, we've had it, that the next few decades will be the end of the kind of civilization we're used to. Throughout history, massive systemic change has always seemed impossible until suddenly it wasn't. As Ursula Le Guin said, we live under capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Socialist revolution remains the only way to build a world that is sustainable and just. A world that doesn't rely on the destruction of the only home our species has ever had. We've known this for over a century, and the capitalist powers have crushed that possibility every time. 
through coups, invasions, sabotage, assassinations, whatever it takes to keep the average person from realizing that there is a better alternative. I remember when I was a kid on a warm night, my family would all go outside and we'd, we'd try to catch fireflies. It was one of the most magical things to see, all these tiny twinkling lights floating all around you. And you'd catch one and you'd look at it and you'd think, wow, how does something like this exist? A couple decades later and I have a one-year-old daughter. She's going to grow up without ever seeing a sight like that. It's the little things like this that make you stop and think. The clock is ticking. It's socialism or extinction. Which side are you on? Hey there. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I recently launched a new channel. It's hard to believe, but for the past 10 years now, I've made my living as a creative professional. Over that time, I've picked up a lot of useful tips and tricks, and now I'd like to share them with the next generation of creators. This new channel is dedicated not only to teaching others how to make a career out of working creatively, but also to sharing some general musings on living a creative life. I'm really excited for this project, and I hope I can make a difference to anyone out there who wants to do what I do, but doesn't know where to start. So if you are interested in YouTube, or podcasts, or documentary work, or just want a little peek behind the scenes, consider subscribing. I've got three videos out already, and the fourth episode is coming next Friday. I'm going to stagger the releases of Second Thought and this new channel so that you've always got something to watch Friday mornings at 9am Central Time. As always, thanks for watching, drop a thumbs up if you liked the episode, thumbs down if you hated it, and I'll see you in the next one.